Hello and welcome to another episode of Forty Guard Live. I'm Derek Mankey and joining me again, so good to see you as always, Amar. How are you doing? Amar Lakani. I, I am doing wonderful. It's uh, I'm enjoying a Texas winter, so it's about 75 degrees here today, so awesome. Yeah, it's the same thing up here in Canada, actually, so it's, uh, it's just the new world that we live in, huh? <laughs> a Texas winter in Canada, that's the first uh, time I've yeah. been so awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bringing the love here. So... Uh, you know, I want to talk about ransomware again. I know we've talked about this a lot, um, but it's important, right? Because it really is, uh, the, you know, the largest threat that we see. Um, there's so many, so many things happening every day, every week. It seems not not just with the threat landscape, but with, with, with uh, ransomware as well. And if we look at the way that the technology, the payloads evolved, one of the things that we called out in our 2022 predictions, and we've already seen some indications of this was an aggressive and destructive capability in the malware itself, in the ransomware, right? Uh, so that includes wiper malware and things that are doing like massive boot record destruction. Uh, we've seen in the, in the past uh, partition wiping too. And that's something I think we're gonna continue, continue to see too next year, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, as a threat researcher, anytime I do anything like reverse malware engineering, ransomware typically wasn't that exciting for me. I used to like really like looking at botnets. I like like looking at rootkits. They were like a little more exciting because they they did things. For the most part, what ransomware does is it uses an API call to encrypt your files, and that's it. It wasn't really too exciting. But we've definitely seen see things change, as you said. Like ransomware has gotten a lot more aggressive. So because of that, we see like, you know, ransomware that has like this wiper uh, destructive uh, pieces to it. And that's more interesting than what's happening in the code and also a big difference of what we're seeing in the aggressiveness of ransomware. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I remember years ago too, when I, I first had a presentation on ransomware it was at Sector in 2010. And that was just, you know, that was the initial stages of the commercial ransomware. It was just going, you know, basically using an, an XOR, <laughs> an XOR uh, a key uh, to do the to do the uh, encryption is very basic. A lot of bugs in that malware back then, not too exciting, like you said. But that's what we're seeing now is the shift to really driving a lot more uh, innovation on there and being more aggressive, like I said, including the wiper components and, and all of that too. So that's uh, it's definitely something to be concerned about. But it doesn't stop there, right? Because they, we've seen a big shift in their tactics now as well, where they're taking not only uh, this aggressive strategy, but also commoditizing this, right? Like it's not just not just ransomware as we know it as malware, but including the whole uh, left to right attack surfaces or attack chain story with that, right? So things like including botnets with it, the loader components, um, having a way to penetrate and get into systems and all that sort of stuff. And really what's becoming a turnkey solution for cyber. Yeah, that's, I, I know this is going to sound a little strange, but that is what's exciting for me as a threat researcher is looking at the new type of techniques and what they're building in into ransomware. As you said, it's not a single file that's encrypting your, your system anymore. It has botnets into it. The last ransomware that I looked at actually had a commercial VPN provider that was built into it as well to kind of try and hide what's happening on the network layer so you can do deep inspection. Uh, you see like other components as well. What used to happen is you used to have bot a botnet as uh, you know your first type of infection and then you had some sort of uh, rad remote access trojan that came in and attackers used to like try and steal information. They got into your organization, uh, expanded ver vertically throughout the organization and then ransomware was normally the last, last piece of it. Yeah. Now those techniques are still very similar. That's really like how, how the attack time cycle goes within that period of time. But it's now normally one file or it's in one component or one family, right? It can still be module components, but it can be one family. So it's all really built in. It's working a lot better. It's working a lot more efficiently together. And the attackers kind of have this whole package that they're building and sending out. Even when you look at things like rans ransomware as a service, the kits that they're building have all these components built into them. They have the initial attack, they have the stealthy part of that attack, then they have the botnet, and then they have the ransomware kind of in one package ready to deploy a lot of times. Yeah, and what's worse is, so you mentioned that, I'm glad you mentioned that the ransom as a service. What's worse is that they are customizing this as well. Not only do we have more than one ransomware family, right? there's a lot of them as we report on all the time, including our threat landscape report. But we're also seeing, uh, you know, um, the kits, right? Builder kits that, that are being sold with these where the affiliate or whoever is wanting to launch that ransomware can customize it, they can pack it themselves. And that's all about security evasion and things they're trying to do. But it also comes with these uh, kits like the building te technology with it. 
Yeah, absolutely. When I, when I look at a lot of ransomware as a service, especially uh, the advertisements that are out there, uh, I kind of see like three categories. Like the first one is like the most sophisticated one, one that's extremely customized, one that really works with their affiliate to like target an organization and really understand what that organization is doing. Um, I would say this is almost like the, the top level threat actor, maybe even state sponsored type attacks. I, I don't know, but it's very, very sophisticated. Um, on the bottom, you have the general like, let's build it, uh, take it out. Uh, kind of the spray and pray techniques and they're really they're getting really popular because they've been extremely effective but there are much more generalized pieces of software more, much more commodity pieces of software and then as you said there's kind of like this middle piece where they have like the techniques and the foundation that's built into ransomware as a service and then you as an affiliate if you decided to be an affiliate hopefully no one's deciding to be an affiliate mm -hmm. right now but if you had decided to become an affiliate then you can customize it and put certain components or change a couple of pieces of code around and it's very object oriented you can like almost click and point and see what you want to change around and then just deploy your ransomware that way if an attack or a real evil guy was uh, considering that yeah not not only yeah the object oriented they have nice actually nice well nice in a bad way <laughs> um you know user interfaces that they've built for this drag and drop like you said and nice ways that they can easily uh package these into those customized routines right so that's that's a big problem actually that we're seeing it's a big challenge too because not only is it just the the, pay, the payload itself that can be customized that way, but their campaigns also going back to that kit that we're talking about. They can also customize spam templates that they're using to try to infect people, as as an example, right? And, uh, and that's why it's not just a monolithic, you know, one campaign that we're seeing. Even with one ransomware family, there's so many different variants, different affiliate campaigns that are being launched, and each one of those has their own flavor of attack too, which is, um, you know, a, a a big point that you have to be aware of from an intel threat intelligence and visibility aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the targets a little bit more. You mentioned the targets, and that's something that continues to evolve. I mean, we just obviously talked a lot about data before. Uh, we have seen now, um, and I, I know we were talking about this before, you are mentioning that you saw more Android-based ransomware now. I, you know, with the rise of Mirai being our number one botnet that we see on IoT that, you know, typically used for DDoS attacks, but you got to think that a lot of this is heading that way to IoT, to uh, Smart Edge, and certainly to OT environments too, especially when we talk about those targeted attacks, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, so, I mean, we're seeing ransomware evolve and we've been saying this, I know in a few conversations me and you have is evolving much more beyond just like the Windows operating systems. Of course, we've mentioned like ransomware on Linux based operating systems. We've seen attacks or new types of evolutions of attacks on Mac based operating systems. And for sure, we're seeing things on Android based operating systems as well. In fact, we're seeing an increase in attacks and Android based uh, operating systems. Now, the sophistication obviously is very different on mobile devices because mobile devices are very different in nature. Most of the time, ransomware on mobile devices is not actually encrypting your files. And I know a lot of people think like, wait, isn't ransomware supposed to encrypt everything? Well, if you just think about the nature of mobile devices, the power it takes to encrypt uh, every file that's out there, you're probably going to run out of battery before all your files get encrypted. What they do most of the time is they have a system call that basically replaces your window. That, says that window doesn't go away until you pay that ransom. Uh, you can't get rid of the window you can't like force quit that window if you reboot the phone that window shows up so your phone is still pretty much not usable at the same time what android malware and android ransomware is doing is they're trying to steal other information that you may have loaded on your phone uh this could include your banking apps other apps as well now of course the apps are getting much more better in security so kind of hard for malware to do that but it's still a possibility the other thing that ransomware is doing is it's using things like toll fraud and sms fraud and phishing and uh, stealing your contacts and other things as that in that nature as well that attacker could use for other types of attack whether it's mobile or not mobile phone so Obviously, the operating systems are doing a lot better in like figuring out how attackers are attacking. But uh, what manufacturers, what the bad guys, what the threat actors are doing is when they're creating this type of ransomware is they're using basically functions uh, in, a, in, in a way that they really weren't intended to be used and taking advantage and abusing those functions. Yeah, yeah, great point. And, and I think we have to be uh, cognizant of that. Ransom isn't just about the data, right? The current, like we always talked about data being the currency and ransom is any way that they can try 
to hit you where it hurts, right? What is valuable to you? That's what they're going to be going after, right? And in a business sense, we talk about that with business continuity, with uh, revenue streams, uh, all the way down to the consumer, right? Their their mobile phone. If they can't use their phone in a day or two, they're probably you know a consumer is probably going to care about that. Same thing, of course, with work environments and even to uh, online gaming and, and uh, platforms too. We talked about esports being a big target for next year in 2022, and you can think about the ransom capabilities within there. It's absolutely down the same path too. So I think it's going to be a lot of, and this is, it's more tactical. That's what I mean. We're talking about, it's not just about, you know, spray and pray, like you said, trying to hit systems and trying to uh, make sure that they got the right files or hope that they got the right files and, uh, and, and get some money. It's much more tactical than that. And that's just going to continue to get worse. I think when we have more, more and more and more of these affiliates joining and more of um, each one of those, like I said, running their own campaign and then having a toolkit like we talked about, right, to be able to customize those too. So, yeah, I don't want to mention a little bit about esports. One one thing that I, you know, it, it's becoming a pretty big target for uh, for threat actors, especially with with ransomware. Um, you know, I remember back in the day when esports was like, you know, represented something like that Fred Savage movie, The Wizard, back in the day. <laughs> but that that was that, that was wonderful, like the Nintendo World Awards. But these days, esports is a multi billion dollar industry, and what we're starting to see, especially in some hacker boards, is that attackers are actually targeting these famous esports players and understand or even these organizations or even venues and they understand that they do things like denial of service attacks or other types of attacks they can really that really cost these venues a lot of money and these players a lot of money because that's how they're making a living and that they're actually going after they're targeting and they're finding like uh you know people that depend on esports or make a living off esports or there's a lot of or any any avenue where there's a lot of money attached to that venue and then they're attacking those venues specifically and there's a lot of talk and a lot of chatter on some hacker channels on hacker boards and different types of groups on uh, targeting those systems and i think we're just starting to see this in 2021 i think in 2022 we're going to see a lot more is going to be a lot more visible it's still not really mainstream yet at least from the attacks attack point of view it's not mainstream yet i think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that in esports yeah absolutely yeah i still have my power glove amar from, from from the nes but but i think like he said it's much more than that now than just the consoles absolutely it's about the platforms and I, I completely agree with you i think there's going to be a lot of activity and like you said there's, there's already chatter brewing um it's inevitable, I think, for, for those to be targeted. So uh, there's a lot that we talked about here. Um, there's always a lot of, of bad news out there, but let's talk about some of the strategy and good news. What, what can we do about this in summary? I mean, you know, one of the good parts about this is that because they're being more aggressive and in your face, so to speak, um, it is much more visible. So I think having a good plan, a good proactive plan definitely helps here, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things is, is kind of, uh, it almost seems a little counterintuitive, but you're, you're absolutely right since you know, some of the malware is much more aggressive and it is being packed into, you know, more capabilities. You have more opportunities to detect those capabilities. So you still have a very stealthy component of this malware, especially with the initial infection and initial access. But once the malware starts running, you actually do have a lot of opportunity to catch that. So, uh, you know, solutions like EDR solutions uh, are working really well. Network-based IP IPS is actually working really well to catch things in transit. Now, of course, like that means you have to have proper configurations and setups and stuff where you're looking at deep packet inspection, uh, looking through things uh, through encrypted channels. But I think um, one good thing, like one thing that I'm happy about is that that there are there's definitely more opportunity to catch and detect that and to stop those type of attacks. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important is that now, because like we talked about, it's not just about the payload, not just about malware and the ransomware. We're talking about a whole, the whole attack chain because that's what it's about now. It's in a kit, it's turnkey, all these moving parts in that. And whenever we talk about attack chain, we talk about kill chain. And of course, this is where we talk about everything being integrated to be able to catch that because you have all those opportunities to catch it at any point there, right? Through the mesh architecture and security fabric. Uh, with all that threat intelligence, you need that because it's changing as we know in FortiGuard Labs. You know, every day, every minute, every every second now, really. Um, anyway, good stuff, Omar. It's always good talking to you. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, this is Derek Mankey again with FortiGuard Live. You can check out all the stuff we've been talking about, including what's coming up next uh, for trends and our latest coverage and protections on our blog at blog.fortinet.com. Thank you.